Hi folks, my name is Adam and I like to make tiny nerdy things. And today I made a heckin' adorable tiny hobbit hole. Now there's lots of different layouts for bag end onto internets, but my favorite one is this layout from Way to Workshop, so I'm gonna use that as my template. I also thought it might be fun to have the doorway kinda, but not really open so you can kinda, but not really see into the house, so I made the entry hallway out of this cardboard tube. So once I cut it to the correct length, I flattened the bottom and then used a little XPS foam to make the front of the house. The door frame is cut using one of my tiny hole punches, and then the windows are cut in the exact same method. Then it's just a case of repeating the exact same process a bunch more times until I've got all the facades done for the parts of the hobbit hole that you'll actually see. Now I took a fair amount of time to try and block out all the stonework around the door frames and around all the window frames by carving each individual brick into it, which you'll see a little down the road it doesn't actually serve any purpose because the paint obscures it all anyways. But at least I know it's there and as long as you watch this video you'll know it's there too. Now to outline the bricks and give them a bit more depth that we won't see anyways, I'm going to press down everywhere that isn't the brick so that they stand out a little bit more against the backdrop of the wall. Here I'm making little overhangs or I mean, maybe they're underhangs? Here I'm making these things which will get glued in place before I add the little wooden beams that hold it all in place. Then I can add the little angled bricks that go beneath the windows and then repeat the process with all the other facades. Then back to attempting this hallway. So I cut out a little doorway on the side and then sanded a round section out and just filled it with a smaller cardboard tube. I think this tube is from a spool of thread that is just now sitting in a tangled heap, but it was for a worthy cause. Then I chopped the back in half and filled it in with a piece of XPS foam, which will act as like the wooden sort of frame. And then I glued it all back together again. So it's one long tube. Then I cut a fake doorway into the back of it, gave it a little frame of fake wood, and then I added these little beams in just to give it a little bit more life. Then it is essentially finished. Now I don't know why, but I always loved the hobbit hole doors just because they're a circle and I don't know. It's just so simple, but it's so appealing to me. So I made a circle and cut some wooden grooves into it and then snapped the head of a pin off, which will get glued into the center and that will be the door pull. What the hell's a door pull? Door handle. I'll attach the front door later, but the back door can just get glued into place. Then we're on to making the hill itself. So this is the thickest foam I have that also happens to be the exact same height as all those pieces of the house that I made. It's entirely unintentional, but it is a happy accident nonetheless. So I'll use the map as a template and I'll use my karate to knock the general shape of the hobbit hole out before flattening all the sides so that I can attach the room facades. Before I do that, however, I'll need to cut the entrance hall and oak hall out so that I can fit my stupid tube in place. Then it's as simple as gluing the fronts in place, and if you're aiming for a recreation from the Soviet Lord of the Rings, you could probably just stop right here. I, however, am going to press onwards. So we'll add a little base onto the bottom of it, and then I will trace out on said base where the hallway is going to lay. Then I'll carve some tiles into the foam just using my carving tools, and then I'll add a top coat of black Mod Podge before giving it a nice coat of terracotta. Now I did make a bit of a goof here and I forgot to add any wash onto it, but I'm still not fully convinced that this is going to work anyways, so whatever. Then I'll paint inside the hallway, laying down a nice white base coat before going over the entire thing with that patented Hobbit off white. Then I can paint the beams and the back wall brown before highlighting with a lighter brown dry brush, and then it's pretty well ready to get glued into place. I like to use hot glue with this foam since it sets really quickly and it fills the room with a nice aromatic lung cancer haze. Then I can mark out the pathway for the little stepping stones as well as where I want the stairs to go and then we can get on to shaping the general body of the hill. Now I realized I hadn't left quite enough room for the little side section where the stairs will go so I'll glue another piece in place and then I can start adding in the top of the hill. It's just random bits and pieces because I'm going to go over the entire thing with some filler anyways. 
but I don't want to waste my filler, so I'm going to make as much of it as I can. And once the glue is set, we can start shaping the hillside by cutting a, uh, a hilly shape. And now remember to use a sharp blade and always cut towards your body. This way your body stops the blade from damaging your desk or its surroundings. Now the hallway inside is a bit dark, so I wanted to add a teeny tiny light into it. So I've drilled a tiny hole in the top and then I'll use a little hot glue to set it in place. And then the rest of the wiring is run through the bottom into a section that I've cut out. I'll also use a little bit of masking tape just to hold the guts in so that it doesn't fall out while I'm finishing the rest of the hill. And we're on to making the stairway. Now the stairs are just going to be some small thin strips of XPS foam that are glued on top of each other. And it doesn't matter how well they align since I'm going to fill all these gaps and give it a bit more of a hilly texture so it's not quite so square and straight everywhere. For the filler, we're going to use this One Strike Filler. Not a sponsor, but my god, this stuff is the tits. It's super easy to apply, very lightweight, and incredibly flexible. It's a bit of a pain in the ass if you need to sand it down, but we're not sanding, we're only chopping, so this is ideal for what we need. It's also easy to shape into place, and it builds up really well. Again, not a sponsor, I just really like it. Then one of the last things I need to do is build the little patio that leads from the stairs to the doorway, which can be made out of a single piece of foam. I find it's a lot easier to make one piece of foam look like a bunch of cobblestones, rather than make a bunch of individual cobblestones look like they fit together properly. Then a little tacky glue will hold that in place, and I'll use a little tiny bit of a balled up aluminium foil to provide a little bit more stone texture to the steps and to the top of the cobblestones. Then I'll do the exact same thing onto the back of the house, where the back door is, with a much smaller little patio thing. Then we're on to our black Mod Podge top coat. Now you notice I apply this using a swirling motion, and there's probably a good reason for that. I have no idea, but if you know, let me know in the comments below. It's at this point that I realized I forgot to add the little cobblestone pathway leading from the front to the back, but fortunately Mod Podge is a glue, so it should be pretty easy just to add the little cobblestones in after the fact. Once that's dried, we're ready to add our brown Mod Podge base, which will act as the ground color as well as providing a glue for the dirt and plaster mix that goes over top. Now I know what you're thinking, hey Adam, if you're gonna go over the entire thing in brown Mod Podge, why bother with a black Mod Podge in the first place? I don't know, it made sense in my little pea brain when I started, but now it just kinda seems like a colossal waste of time. I guess if nothing else, it's extra durable now. The dirt and plaster mix is exactly what it sounds like, it's dirt and plaster mixed in relatively equal quantities. It gets applied everywhere, then brushed off the building faces in the stone, and then the redundant Mod Podge base should be enough to hold it all in place, but a quick spritz of water should seal the deal. Now, if you remember way back to about 30 seconds ago when I said I don't think things through, well, here's another example of that. In hindsight, I should have painted all the parts of the building before adding the dirt and plaster, because trying to get into all these little nooks and crannies is an exercise in patience and competence, two things that I don't really have in great supply. Regardless, I'll crack on with it, painting all the walls a beautiful hobbit in yellow before painting the beams brown and the bricks varying brick colors. Now while I'm patiently and competently painting in the background, I want to take a minute and thank my newest patrons who make it possible for me to make tiny, nerdy things. Travis Romani, Adam Johnson, Rumari, Benjamin, Calathio, Maddie Mads, Colin Doncaster, Aria, and Ray Glenwright. These silly videos take an inordinate amount of time and your help has been invaluable. If you want to help the channel out, follow the link in the description below. My Patreon is where you'll find lots of the behind the scenes stuff, works in progress, and the general ramblings of my seemingly syphilitic mind. For the windows I've left the background black so that I can fill the space with the UV resin. And once a little purple laser blast has cured the resin, I'll try and mostly successfully paint the wooden lattice work onto the windows. Now a better person than myself would have made the windows out of wood, but, you know, I'm not a better person. I'm willing to go so far as to say that these are passingly decent from a distance of two or more meters away. I also realized that I almost forgot about the numerous chimneys that are sticking out of the top of the hill. That's easily remedied by chopping some foam into rectangles, then cutting vaguely brick-like shapes into them. Then they get a top coat of grey paint before getting hit with a dry brush of lighter grey paint, followed by white. Then all the stonework gets a tasty top coat of black cherry wash. 
Wash is essentially really thinned out black ink that will flow into all the cracks and give all the stonework some really nice detailed shadows. Somebody once told me that wash is basically just talent in a bottle and I'm gonna have to kind of agree with that. You can screw it up if you put it in the wrong place or apply too much of it, but all in all it is my jam. Then all I need to do is glue my chimneys in place, so we'll put one in the spare bedroom, one in the kitchen, and one in the master bedroom. Then we're on to what will be my absolute favorite part. Now the static grass I'm using here is a mix of 2mm springtime and some 3mm vibrant green. And then to hold it all in place, I'll mix a tiny bit of water into matte Mod Podge, and then apply it liberally over everywhere that's covered in dirt and plaster. I'm going to leave a little section at the top there because that's where I want the tree to go and I just want the tree to glue in a little bit more easily. And then we're on to applying the grass. Applying static grass was, is, and will forever be one of my favorite things to do. I could feel myself becoming a cynical old man as the years tick by, but the childlike glee that I feel whenever I add tiny fake grass to a tiny dirt hell is non-quantifiable. Now as far as the applicator is concerned, what it does is it statically charges the grass so that when it lands in the glue it's standing bolt upright. It adds a lot to the look and feel of anything you add it to, but it is absolutely non-essential. You can absolutely just use your fingers to sprinkle the grass all over the place and it will still look awesome. It's the grass itself that looks so good, it's not necessarily the applicator. I just really like gadgets. Static grass is, by definition, staticky, so it will stick anywhere that the glue's been applied. So to keep it off the windows and off the pathway, I'll use a much smaller brush to keep the grass from growing where I don't want it to go. A little extra time spent here will save a ton of headache in the future, and trust me, if I'm the one taking the time to plan ahead, you know it's probably worth doing. Otherwise, you know you're done when everything is green. You can knock a lot of the loose stuff off by turning the hill upside down and spanking it, but all the little Klingons can easily be removed just by using a brush and a vacuum. Then we're on to our Hobbiton Greeblies, starting with the fence. First step is going to be cutting the stir sticks down to the right size. Then once you've got a handful of short stir sticks, give it a quick shake and you'll have a handful of fence posts. Then another quick shake and you'll have a handful of stained fence posts. Then using a little glue and a lot of patience, I built a fence around the front of the hill. And then with the fence finished, I made a tiny gate, which is obviously closed, because... We don't want any more visitors, well wishes, or distant relations! And then it's just adding all the little bits and pieces. So a tiny red mailbox, a little bench up beside the front door, and a tiny table near the back door. Then using some small dowel and a bit of silver paint, I made a few little casks of ale to fill in some of the spaces. I ended up cutting way more fence posts than I needed, so I stacked the rest up beside the house. Now with all the larger pieces in place, we're ready to add the flock and the leaves and the dirt and the detritus. This will be what takes our little hobbit hole from a grassy hill to a beautifully overgrown castle fit for a three foot tall king. Now it's looking good, but I want to add a tiny bit of color. We're kind of green at this point. I don't have any teeny tiny flowers, but I do have some teeny tiny bushes that we can turn into flowers. Perhaps a pot of purple paint will be perfect for progressing our palette into prime position. And then we're ready to render our rural resources red with a relatively robust rouge to really ramp up these reeds. Right? But why? Finally, I'll add a little bit of the flock into random spots and press it down into the grass. This foam flock is perfect for simulating a little bit of overgrowth in the grass and for adding a little bit of color variation. Plus I love flock, so I'll take any opportunity to use it. In particular, I'm going to make sure that I cram it down into the sections of the hill where maybe the grass isn't quite as thick, and I'm also going to press it down on top where the sections of the roof kind of stick out. Anywhere that I think water would be pooling and you'd get more weed and moss and a little bit more growth. And then a heavy misting of isopropyl alcohol, followed by a soaking in thinned out Mod Podge, will lock everything in place. 
One of the most common questions I get asked in the comments is, what does the isopropyl alcohol do? A simple explanation is that it soaks into whatever you're gluing and breaks the surface tension so the glue can soak in. It's also thinner than water so it won't beat up and it evaporates quite quickly. Now the sand on the left will be my boozy sand and the sand on the right is the teetotaling sand. When you apply glue directly onto dry sand, you can see how it beads up and changes the shape of the sand. And then with the sand that's been saturated with isopropyl alcohol, the glue doesn't bead on top and it spreads evenly throughout the pile. With the hill itself done and the house built, we can get started on the tree. Now I know a lot of people make their trees out of hot glue or sticks from the garden, but I really like to make my trees out of very fine wire. I find it's easy enough to work with and it can be bent into whatever shape you're after. So the very first step I do is I spin the entire thing around into a single pillar. Then I'll separate that pillar into however many main branches I want, and then I'll just start dividing those branches. Each pair of branches will get twisted into a smaller pair, which gets twisted into a smaller pair, and so on and so forth until you're back to just single wires. It's a slow and methodical process that can easily take up a day, but I really like how the wire trees look when you're finished. Now it is worth taking your time and being careful, as the fine gauge wires can be pretty sharp, so just be a little bit careful. And once you've reached the end of the wire, you can either turn them back on themselves to make the final branch, or you can just snip the end. I prefer snipping the ends of them, so that my last branch is always going to be a tiny bit thicker. Then with one main branch done, you can get started on all the other branches. It's the exact same process, starting big and going small. I find by this point I'm pretty lightheaded and dizzy. My guess is that all the spinning and twisting of the wires gives me slight vertigo, but a good night's rest and a cookie usually helps. Finally, the root system is made in the exact same way, but with just fewer branching sections and generally shorter roots. And then the final tweaks can be made to the branches until you're happy with how it looks. After a little cleanup, we're ready to apply the brown Mod Podge. This stuff acts as both a base coat and a gap filler and is essential for making it look more like a tree and less like a bundle of wires. Then I'll coat the entire thing in a dark brown, highlight it with some light dry brushing, and then go over the trunk and any of the larger branches in a burnt umber wash. To add all the leaves, I'm going to use some Woodland Scenics Clump Foliage. Because I knew I was only going to have time to make a single tree, it seemed like a really good idea to try something that I've never done before. So I sprayed the tips of the branch with a spray adhesive that was way thicker than I wanted, and it left me with a horrible spooky Halloween tree. Fortunately, it was sticky enough that dipping the branches in the foliage worked pretty well, and it was good enough to hide all those spooky white cobwebs. And then to add a little variation in the color, I'll sprinkle some different colors of fine flock over the top. Finally, to lock it all in place, I'll do the old essential IPA soak and seal. Once it's had adequate time to dry, it's ready to be plopped in place. A little tacky glue on the underside of the roots will hold it in place, and I'll fill the gaps with a mixture of fine sand and detritus. The detritus is just dead leaves and branches from the garden that I put in a blender and sifted the finest bits out. And using a spoon, I can pop it into all the places I need and it will fill in a lot of the gaps. A little bit of a brush will spread it out so it's not quite so clumpy. And then we're ready to add a tiny bit of non-static grass, as well as a little bit of fine flock over the top of it. This will help blend it in and it will match the rest of the hill a little bit better. And then as always, the final step will be adding a little bit of IPA as well as a little bit of glue to seal it in place. Then the finishing touch will be adding a tiny angry sign onto our little gate, and then we're on to our glamour shots. Oh hey, you still here? Awesome sauce! Well if you like what you saw, consider subscribing, or commenting, or hitting the like button, or sharing with all your friends, you know, just the usual stuff. Otherwise we'll uh, we'll see you next week. Cheers!